This program, while curated to help you improve your health, contains general advice and should not replace the individual advice of your medical practitioner. How did you feel in that moment? Uh, I felt that you should dream. You should dream. You should voice it. You should wonder. And you should hold open those possibilities. How long do you think it will take to change? I think the more people that get to encounter the information and start to see the differences in their own life, the faster it'll come. Tell me, what does it mean to be a human superorganism? Well, that's the idea that you're multi-species. You're essentially a walking coral reef. Is there any role between humans living together and their effect on each other's microbiomes? Yes, that's a really interesting question. In life, it's normal to have ups and downs. But what do we do when we get stuck? I've always been fascinated by the healing journey. Why do some people get better while others fail to make the shift? Welcome to the Expert Series, where you'll meet 25 of the world leaders in health and wellness, discussing their passions and what it takes to make your shift. There's an electrical feeling in the room. I had to be a mom. It was so important to me. I've always been a pain in the butt, and I love that. I knew that I wanted to help people. I'm Catherine Maslin, and this is The Shift. Hi, I'm Catherine Maslin, naturopath, author, and host of The Shift. In the expert series, we share the insights, stories, and expertise of each of our amazing experts. You might have met them on season one of The Shift, where we took snippets of these conversations and put them together into the series. If you haven't listened to season one yet, I'd recommend going back and listening to episode one on what it takes to make a shift in your gut health. We'll provide a link in the show notes. In this episode, we have the amazing Rodney Dieterth, PhD. Rodney is a professor of immunotoxicology at Cornell University and the author of the book, The Human Superorganism, which is all about microbiome research and what that means for human health. Rodney's background is in reducing the environmental health risks for children to protect them against chronic disease. And this provided an excellent platform for him to move into microbiome research. Rodney is a full professor at Cornell University in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology. He's a faculty member in the Cornell Institute for Comparative and Environmental Toxicity. Rodney has published peer-reviewed papers in more than 70 different scientific journals, ranging from environmental health and paediatric medicine to nutrition, metabolism, immune, neurological and reproductive journals. As I mentioned, Rodney is the author of the book, The Human Superorganism, as well as being the co-author of the books, Strategies for Protecting Your Child's Immune System and Science Sifting. He's also edited two state-of-the-art technical books in environmental health, immunotoxicology and chronic disease. I have to say, I could have talked to Rodney for hours. And as it is, we're giving you the best parts of our two-hour conversation, which was held on a snowy day in January at Cornell University in upstate New York. You'll learn about how important the microbiome is to the survival of our species, the story of antibiotics, how your microbes can make you fat, and the effect of your microbes on chronic disease. Once you've listened to this episode, if you want to hear more from Rodney, listen to season one of The Shift, where he contributes to several of the episodes there. Strap yourself in, because this one is mind-blowing. My name is Rodney Dietert. I'm originally from San Antonio, Texas, born in Virginia, and working at Cornell University in Ithaca, New York, uh, for several decades. What do you do here? Well, I've been uh, a jack-of-all-trades, or worn many different hats, and directed several different programs. But I work on the immune system and the microbiome and early life in particular, and the things that we can do to better protect our health by what we eat, activities that we do, and uh, staying away from harmful chemicals and drugs. And the way in which these affect us, particularly recognizing that we are, in many ways, majority microbial. I want to get a little bit of backstory on you and just try to understand your life and how you've actually come to being here today. So tell me where you were born. I was born uh, on an army base, Fort Lee, Virginia, and uh, 
for just six weeks of my life was there until my parents relocated to their home, which was San Antonio, Texas. So I grew up largely in in uh, South Central Texas. What was it like growing up there? It was fantastic. It was sort of a sleepy, large city had the feel of being able to move around freely, had lots of activities, you know, uh, generally warm temperatures. And so you could be outdoors and doing a lot of things uh, in that regard. And it was a rich culture uh, located near near Mexico, a uh, major Latino population, majority Latino, in fact, and, and yet had uh, Czech, Polish, Italian and uh, German communities, uh, some, some still speaking uh, those languages of their homeland uh, when I was growing up. So in the 50s and 60s, it, it was a, a wonderful cultural mix, just a tremendous environment to be in. So tell me, when did you make a decision that you wanted to get into research and education? Uh, early on, I uh, had done several science fairs and uh, my dad was very instrumental in, in supporting that and in helping me and, and guiding me a bit and coaching me. And so the science fair experience, uh, I knew I wanted to be a scientist. And the real turning point was a, a National Science Foundation funded uh, Summer Science Institute that I attended at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And it was run by uh, a longtime uh, high school biology teacher there. But it exposed uh, those participants to the whole range of science, the, you know, a physical biology, and I got to work in a genetics lab. And so I actually thought I wanted to be a geneticist and in a sense was trained in genetics. But as, as happens or can happen at Cornell, the world is totally open to you here in terms of what you can study, what you can do. And it turned out after I got here, I, I moved really out of focusing on genetics to focusing on environment and environmental health and how to better protect ourselves as we live on planet Earth in this environment. Now, I should say many things happened that shoved me off of my plan. And I actually have taught a course at Cornell on overcoming roadblocks and creative problem solving that is really based on being prepared to, to maybe reach your goal through a route you never envisioned. And that's, that's sort of what happened because it was not linear. I had roadblocks I thought were absolutely killing the career and the path, and those showed up at various times. And nevertheless, it all worked out in, in a wonderful way. Can you tell me about one of those roadblocks? Oh, absolutely. I applied to graduate school in molecular genetics or molecular biology at the time at Harvard Medical School. And they flew me up from Duke University where I was an undergraduate and uh, paid my way to interview me. And it looked wonderful. Like it was going to work out. But my GRE scores came in and they were a little bit lower than, than Harvard has very high GRE scores for graduate school. So I didn't get in. And I was resigned to working in uh, an immunogenetics lab because they would let me do the genetics I wanted to do, but I had to sort of tolerate working on the immune system or working in a lab where that was the focus, was the immune system. Well, it was an incredible mentor who actually had been trained at Caltech by a fantastic immunogeneticist. Uh, and I had no real interest in the immune system. But guess what? I then became an immunologist which I had not planned. <laughs> so I accepted it as here's the price to pay for doing some genetics that I wanted to do and working with cells and, and looking at early environment and cancer and the relationship between those and doing some genetics. But I'd have to learn the immune system. Well, little did I know, but three years later, I'm teaching immunology at Cornell as a faculty member. And so I thought rejected by Harvard, oh, that was my last chance. I, I guess I'll never do that. And then again, three years, a three-year PhD, no postdoctoral training, and I'm a faculty member at Cornell in the Ivy League. How fantastic. How did you feel in that moment? Uh, I felt that you should dream. You should dream. You should voice it. You should wonder. And you should hold open those possibilities because they can come in. They can happen. Are there any other moments in your life like that that you Oh, a recall? lot. I mean, my whole career got changed because of a middle-of-the-night dream, and that's the reason that I'm working on the microbiome. It was not by planning. What was the dream? What happened, there's a, a bit of a backstory, uh, is I was given a challenge, and that was to contribute a paper to a special issue that was asking what could you measure in a newborn baby that would best predict whether that baby's life was filled with health or filled with disease. What one thing could you measure? And we would call that a biomarker. The issue itself was actually called biosemiotics, which is 
a term out of linguistics, and it means sign. So what's the baby sign that would tell you whether it would be a healthful baby or, or, or one burdened with disease burden? And we know that a newborn infant's going to experience, you know, going to eat different things, going to have different environmental experiences. A lot of things will happen to that baby as the baby grows that will affect health. So we know that. But the question is, is there anything you could measure right around that period in early life that would be useful, that would be really predictive? And having worked for decades on the developing immune system and how to protect the immune system against insult and disease outcomes, I was pretty sure, well, I've got the answer, boy. It's right here with the developing immune system. And I sat down to write, start writing the paper and got about two paragraphs in, and it was just garbage. It was, I couldn't convince myself of arguments that I was trying to say. So I was very frustrated and I went to bed that night and I woke up about 3.30 in the morning from what was just an incredible, really vivid, intense dream. I actually don't remember the parts of the dream at this point. I only, I woke up and I thought, wow, I've been dreaming, my goodness. Wow, the answer is the baby has to self-complete. The baby born without a microbiome without the microbes that inhabit our GI tract, our skin, our airways, or your genital tract, that baby is not complete. The complete baby as intended, as was there in our ancestors and as intended, is one rich in the microbes. So the extent to which, if you were looking for a sign or one thing you could measure, the extent to which the baby has self-completed with a robust, matched, microbiome would be the best biomarker. What is the microbiome? The microbiome is the collection of bacteria, viruses, fungi, archaea that inhabit, in this case, the human body, if it's the human microbiome, but they inhabit all complex organisms. So again, they're in other animals, they're in plants. There is a soil microbiome. So there, there are media that are said to have a microbiome. So there is the stratosphere, the upper stratosphere has a microbiome. Water has a microbiome. Soil has a microbiome. So essentially, the main form of life on Earth is microbial. We are a microbial planet first and foremost, and we're privileged to be one of the ultimate distributors of microbes around the globe because we're very mobile and we can spread them around and we can protect them and us. And in doing so, I think we'll better protect Earth. Why is the microbiome important? It's important because it is really the principal gateway to the world. It is the filter or the lens through which we see what's outside of us. So again, all chemicals, drugs, and food are filtered by the microbiome. And we only sense what's there with them having dealt with it first. So who knows what's really there? We know what we think we're seeing and what we sense. But given that the microbiome is globally spread, it is probably the network that is most prevalent and that we underutilize. So again, it's our majority, vast majority of genes, over 99%, and a slight majority of cells estimated at approximately 57%. But you, know, you, you can say we're either equal or just slightly majority microbial in cell number. Certainly body weight, we're not. I mean, it's about three pounds, they think, of microbes. Um, but it means that because we've ignored that or didn't know to look there, that we've ignored what may be the most important part of our metabolism, our physiology, and our capacity to, in a healthy way, engage what's outside our body. The microbes communicate with each other they communicate with us. And that's one of the reasons me, I'm talking about the network of microbes being so important. Can you tell me about the current state of the human microbiome? Well, we know that from work of people like uh, Gloria Dominguez-Bello uh, and, and, and others that um, in the US, for example, we're about 35 to 40% degraded in our microbiome compared to Amazonian uh, indigenous peoples. And as a result, we have the increase in NCDs, all, you know, whether it's asthma or diabetes or obesity or cardiovascular disease or cancer, you go down the line, uh, they've all gone up in prevalence since about the 60s, 
Um, the indigenous people in Amazon area can become like us within a couple generations of moving first to the suburbs of San Paulo, for example, and then into San Paulo and uh, adopting the diet there in the urban area. So they can have obesity. They don't normally. They can have obesity just by changing diet in the microbiome and degrading it. So it becomes all the more important when you realize that as a population, we're, we're not what we used to be. And that is impinging our capacity to lead a healthy life and even to socialize. You only need to think about what planning needed to go into a child's birthday party then in the 50s versus now. Food accommodations. In my conference next week, food accommodations is an issue, of course. Uh, so it didn't used to be the case. Some things it's a matter of better diagnosis, but other things we've changed. We simply have changed. Our food has changed too, but we've changed. And so we need to reverse this, and we can. We have the tools to start to do that, but only if the health providers are also in sync and people are also aware of this and talking to health providers about it. Once we reverse this, if we reverse this, what will it look like? Yeah, that's what the next book's going to be about, so I, I can't give away too much. But I, I think it affects not just our health, but if you're healthy and you realize what role the microbiome plays and what the opportunities are, you're going to be able to do things differently in a good way. Want to look deeper into your own health? Our virtual naturopathic team help people from all over the world to shift their health and their life. We offer a 90-minute online discovery and diagnostic session where you can find out where you're at, why you're here, and what you need to do about it. Everyone is so unique, and sometimes it can help to have someone break down your journey and see where it is that you need to head next. To find out more, go to theshiftclinic.com and click on Shift With Us. The Shift! I don't know about here, but in Australia, there's lots of television commercials and lots of pro-use of things like ibuprofen and paracetamol mm -hmm. for babies, babies mm -hmm. and young children. Mm -hmm. So your baby has a bit of a fever, mm -hmm. give them some paracetamol. Mm -hmm. And it's actually almost frowned upon that you don't, even though the evidence shows that it is actually largely doesn't prevent febrile seizures. Do you get the same kind of thing here where there's a lot of pushing of these drugs for things that potentially they're not really necessary for? Well, my personal impression is for when I've watched primetime TV that the primary advertisers are pharmaceuticals, actually. So, uh, so you get the whole range of things. A lot of them are for immune-driven and metabolic diseases. Most of them are uh, psoriasis or diabetes, arthritis, obviously blood pressure. Or, and I have to say one of my bones to pick with what we have called chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases is that we don't cure them, largely. We manage. And I think in my book, The Human Superorganism, I talk about the fact that, that you manage them, but we know that one non-communicable disease, or NCD, they're abbreviated, begets others as you age. You can expect when you get to my age, you know, in the 60s, to have two or three. And there are always medications that are medically coded with those diseases, so you're adding medications. And they all have side effects, so you're adding risk of side effects every time you do that and you become dependent on these. So, I mean, all you have to do is ask the question, for patients prescribed statins, what is the physician's plan to remove them from statins? And they don't have one? No, that's not a good pattern. So you have this pattern where people get one NCD and mm -hmm. then they put on a drug, mm -hmm. and they get another NCD mm -hmm. and they put on another drug, or they put on another drug because of the side effect of one of their drugs. How has this happened? Well, it's happened because, and again, I'm not saying that everybody's been irresponsible, but everybody has been like a thoroughbred horse with blinders on. So it's all narrow context. So a physician sees a patient. I'm not an MD, by the way, so this is my personal observations. A physician sees a patient, and they're presenting symptoms. There's something to be dealt with, and the physician will react to those symptoms. So a child may get antibiotics or a child is treated for asthma or a child. Uh, and the physician has probably been unaware of the comorbidities associated with that condition. So in the book, The Human Superorganism, I, I talk about the 32 comorbidities of obesity. 
Childhood obesity is epidemic in the U.S. and several other countries. And if we do nothing different than we've been doing, there are very predictable 32 or more diseases that are in that group of children going to be at higher prevalence than the normal population. So the question is, why aren't we stopping that? Why would we tolerate that? Tell me about antibiotics and how they came to be and the kind of progression of them throughout the years. Well, of course, uh, penicillin was originally discovered by Alexander Fleming, and actually that was serendipity <laughs> in his, his discovery. It was wonderful. He'd had some other breakthroughs. He'd already made some major discoveries, as had his supervisor. Uh, and he was at St. Mary's Hospital in London, and he grew up in a Scottish rural area. And at that time in his career, he had a, had a summer home. And so it's very interesting. Uh, he was going on a month-long vacation. I mean, some people wish they had a month-long vacation to the summer home. But uh, his son, young son, and his wife had already gone out and preceded him outside London to, to their property. And he was really anxious to get out there and play with his son and just enjoy being out of the big city. So he uh, essentially left his lab dirty. He had a bunch of petri dishes and things growing in it and uh, connected to his research. And he just kind of shoved them off to the side where, and then left town and didn't have any help, you know, dishwasher help or lab tech help, and, and left a mess and went on and off. And then he's playing with his son and on this wonderful 30-day break from his work. And he, he goes back to the lab. And the big problem he had was he had a visitor, a distinguished visitor, came to see his lab. And it's like, oh, first day back. Oh, no. And I left things in a mess. So he took the visitor in nevertheless, and he's walking him around, and he goes over to the pile of dirty Petri dishes he left. And he says, well, look at this. I just, you know, I left in a hurry, left a mess. Look at this mess. Picked up the plate and is waving it around. And that's when he noticed what we would call a plaque. And that's where a fungal contamination, because there were people in that building on different floors that worked on molds, fungi. And one of them had contaminated his plate with bacteria on it. And it had killed them so that there was this clear area on the plate for the mold had grown up and it produced penicillin, what later became known as penicillin and the an antibiotic. So it killed the bacteria and he picked it up. And he's w waving it around. And he realizes that shouldn't be there. And he said, that's curious. So my question is, would he have noticed that if it had been just another day of continuous days in the lab doing the same old, same old or you come back from 30 days of playing in the countryside, which we know is where he grew up and enlivened him, playing with his son, diverted, and then you come back and take a fresh look at something. So again, wonderful, wonderful. And again, the kind of thing that I've talked to people when they're roadblocked is, you know, you find something that gives you a reset of your mind, a reset of your observations, so you can see what you couldn't see before as an observer. So Fleming discovered this. And it later, it, it, I think it's described in Martin Blazer's wonderful book, Missing Microbes, where there was a famous fruit, maybe it was a cantaloupe, I think, or watermelon, uh, gr with penicillin growing. And so it, it, Fleming discovered it, but it really took other uh, contributions to industrialize it, to produce it in mass. But it became extremely important in, uh, for example, battlefield injuries and being able to save lives. So uh, penicillin and then subsequent generations of antibiotics are life-saving. They were the miracle drug of the 20th century. But they also were part of, uh, at the time, what we thought was us versus microbes, that we were better off if we could be completely purged of microbes because that was real preventative medicine, was keeping away from bacteria because they could kill you. Well, some could kill you and others you need, and others you need to keep the bad ones from killing you. So... We had this mindset in the 20th century that microbes are evil, bacteria are deadly, and we got to sanitize. We got to pasteurize. We got to sanitize. So we created almost sterile environments, hand sanitizers, told our kids to clean the dirt off of them <laughs> immediately. And at the same time, we were handling our food differently. We had the luxury of frozen foods. We had pr processed foods. And we were moving into urban areas, and that continues today, the megacities. And so I, I have whole talks and opinions on <laughs> what, what a green environment is and what an actual healthy urban environment might look like, and they're not the same. So more of us moved into urban areas, 
lost the connection to the land, lost the connection to actually being around animals, pregnant women, newborns, on animal farms. And yet we knew immunologically you were protected against allergic disease if you were pregnant or had a young child on an animal farm that didn't use pesticides versus living in an urban city in Germany, for example. Some of the urban, called them the German barnyard studies. And what was called hygiene hypothesis was really examples of why you need microbial exposure and microbes in your life safely, but you need them there. So that mindset of going away from microbes are evil, we must kill them all, we must stay away from them, to the baby's got to self-complete. The baby needs a full set of microbes installed in the body or the immune system will grow up to self-destruct, which is essentially the outcome. If the immune system is not adequately trained, it will react against things in the environment it shouldn't, pollen, animal dander, peanuts, fragrances, or it will not recognize a real pathogen from innocuous microbes. So you're actually at greater risk of inflammatory mediated self-destruction and it actually having gaps in your immune repertoire for infectious diseases. You see both. So contrary to what I was taught in immunology, when I was growing up and what I first taught here at Cornell in the 70s, was we always thought the newborn has a full set of immune cells, it's good to go. Everything you need is there in the newborn baby to fight disease. And again, next week at the National Academies of Sciences, I'll be saying that's a fallacy. The immune system of the baby as born has come out of a protected environment that did not permit portions of the immune system to mature. There is uneven maturation of the immune system during pregnancy. And that has to get corrected. And it gets corrected in concert with the microbiome. It involves changing inflammatory responses, and it involves bringing up to balance antiviral responses and things like that. that. If you don't do that, again, there are very predictable sets of diseases that will result. And uh, so the idea that the baby is good to go is like only if you want a world full of diseases and a lifetime full of diseases. The baby's got to co-mature with the microbiome in place. But we now know how to do that. We now know there's still a lot of research questions, a lot of things we don't know about the microbiome, but we do know enough to be able to do useful things. And we shouldn't wait till we know everything about it to be able to do the things that we know are useful. How do we do it? We do it by, if you haven't done it already with young women and to be moms, potential to be moms, do it then. Do it during pregnancy. Help mom and her microbiome and prepare the microbiome that will be installed in the baby by mom, largely. What do you think of the standard practice of using IV antibiotics when a woman's diagnosed with strep B from a swab during her pregnancy? It is a balance that is needed because when you do that, you're going to damage the microbiome. So the question is, what are you going to do about it? If you go that route, you'd better do something about it. Are you essentially are encouraging the birth defect of a deficient microbiome in the baby? And I challenge physicians, if you killed something you did not intend to kill in a person, put it back. And I've said that at national conferences, put it back. You wouldn't do that if with anything else, the do no harm. This is correctable, put it back. But you can only do that if you're actually monitoring what your treatments are doing to the microbiome. So strep B is a serious, potential life-threatening uh, situation for a newborn. It is a risk. But there are ways to manage, to install microbiomes in the newborn, and it should not mean that the newborn never gets a, a sufficient microbiome. What about cesarean sections? Yeah, they are medically necessary in some cases, and nothing we're talking about says don't have a cesarean if they're medically necessary. That's a medical decision, and, and it should be made by the physician. On the other hand, elective cesareans have been on the rise, and we know that babies born by elective cesarean in particular, that changes the immune system because the microbiome is not the same as vaginally delivered babies. The immune system is altered and it is very, very difficult to, it's not that it's impossible, but there are things happening developmentally in the newborn at critical times during what we call critical windows of development for the immune system, for the brain, for other gastrointestinal. 
And the longer you don't have those microbes in place, the greater the chance that you will have developmental roadblocks that will be almost heroic to have to try to correct those later. What do you think the state of health of people in the U.S. is like currently? Uh, I think that it is, uh, you just look at the epidemic increases, it's very discouraging. And while countries eating westernized diets and westernized countries have led the way in that epidemic, the CDC recently estimated that almost three quarters of all deaths worldwide are due to NCDs, not due to infectious diseases, actually. So the developing countries of the world are catching up with us, which is a sad tale indeed. So I think our health overall is, you know, our, our life expectancy is up, but that's because we're living life sick. We're living life dependent on drugs and doctor's visits, and in some cases, increasing needs of caregivers. And it's looking at it is what is the point of living an extra 15 or 20 years when you don't have quality of life? Well, we can change that, and we should. And my next book is going to be on human capacities because once you start to realize you can not have to be chronically ill, then you can start to actually ask some other questions about what your capabilities might be. Tell me, what does it mean to be a human superorganism? Well, that's the idea that you're multi-species. You're essentially a walking coral reef is one of the analogies that I've used, or a mobile tropical rainforest. You're that diverse. So if you're that diverse, you have lots of moving parts to care and nurture. And it means, again, that your daily decisions, your drugs, your food, your activities can all be with that in mind. Uh, there's no perfect microbiome. Uh, there are healthy microbiomes for different people people from different ancestries and people who are eating different diets and living in different climates. They each have their own healthy microbiome. But there are, among the microbes, there are things called keystone species. And the keystone is a critical species that has a unique function. You kill a keystone species, you're usually in deep trouble. So there is one that maintains our mucin layer and keeps our microbes at a healthy distance. You might say that, you know, good fences make good neighbors and they kind of help the fence. They keep the pathogens away from the gut lining, which is only one cell thick. You do not want to damage that one cell thick layer. And from the immune cells, that could lead to reactions you don't want to see happen. That could also damage the gut lining. And there are two different kind of grades of mucin layers that we have. There's kind of a thick one, a narrow thick one, and a, and a broader band. And the microbes visit kind of the less dense band, particularly our friendly microbes. But they keep the pathogens away. I hope you're loving the information in the shift as much as I do. But maybe you're thinking, what do I need to do for me? Take our online assessment to discover what your gut is up to. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash quiz. The shift! Could you list all of the different things that come to mind for you that affect our microbiome that we're exposed to? Sure. So again, the amount of fiber. I, I mean, diet is important, but I want to stress that, in my opinion, working with diet and your microbiome in combination is the most powerful tool because then you're installing microbes that are going to use the diet you know is healthy and you want to eat. If you have well, I use the analogy growing up in San Antonio in the 50s, I was eating Mexican food and probably a lot of fried chicken because that was kind of a thing then. Uh, now I want to eat kale. My microbes were cultivated. I raised a garden of gut microbes that used fried chicken. They're not going to use kale as an energy source. They rebel. They, they essentially can make my body hurt. They can send signals to the brain that will make me crave pizza and fried chicken and, you know, things that it can use as an energy source because it's an imbalanced microbiome raised on fried chicken. So if I were to install kale-loving microbes that could use that, could use fiber, could use, you know, as the energy source, they are going to be sending signals like, this is just what I want, more please. It's like from the, the musical Oliver, more please, sir. Yeah, and they will say that. But when they say more, they, they mean it. They, they have chemical ways to affect your brain. So doing both, getting the fiber you need, getting you know the vegetables you need is important, but it will be easier on your body and maybe 
longer term, maybe it, it will work for you if you're able to also adjust your microbes. So I think that a lot of people don't succeed on just trying to change diet. And I think that more people would benefit and be able to do that if they were also changing their gut microbiome. Absolutely. Is there any role between humans living together and their effect on each other's microbiomes? Yes, that's a really interesting question. The answer is probably, probably yes. So we know, for example, that if you have a dog in the household or, you know, dogs will help you share micro microbiomes. They are really good about going from one person to another and helping spread them, and they do. Um, so yes, there is a, a local effect, and I'll tell you what supports that. Um, first of all, you can do analysis and you can show that there can be some moving closer together on microbiomes of people in the same household. If you have lab animals, so we do a lot of our safety testing and our efficacy drug testing starts with rodents or other animals. And I can tell you that in an animal facility that's maintaining rodent colonies, they have a limited exposure to pathogens deliberately, you know, so they don't, they don't exactly have what's in the wild. Some people have argued maybe we're better to look at animals in the wild in terms of our evaluations than animals in these really confined environmental circumstances. They're more like the urban area, which is a microbial desert. So what happens to those in these lab animal colonies? They start to have microbes derived from the lab animal handlers, humanized microbes. So their microbiome is not robust and they'll pick up microbes from the handler. So you change lab animal technicians, your microbes <laughs> in your lab animals can start to change because they have a new handler. So yes, we share and we share with animals and we share with each other. If we're living in close proximity, we share. Can you tell me about a time where you made a big shift in your life? Yes. Well, one of them would be when I, I, I met Janice, my, my brilliant wife and editor. And that, you know, we just passed an anniversary on our first email exchange, you know, and so that that was a big shift, a wonderful shift. Um, there was a point where, for a variety of reasons, because I'd been a part-time administrator, and I, because the department was tight on space, I closed my research lab, my bench research lab, but with an agreement with the department that I could do global public health type things, like I'm doing now, actually, and write the book like the human superorganism. If you do that, the mantra had been, the dogma, at a research university, a major research university like Cornell, you close your lab, you're dead wood. You're not doing research anymore. You're not bringing in grant money. Grant money is the lifeblood, right? In many ways, I think I became more effective after I closed my lab than when I was focusing narrowly and at the time struggling to balance administration of a, in the last program I administered was the program on breast cancer and environmental risk factors. And it was a really important public health program, but it had nothing to do with my developmental immunology work research. So the grant, attention to grant monies were competing because I had to get grant money for that program. So closing the lab, that was scary because all of tradition says you now become dead wood and your career is over. Only it opened up worlds I never dreamed of and opportunities. And then, of course, there was the dream and the shift to the microbiome. But it's allowed me, I think, the luxury of looking at broad landscapes because I don't have to worry about being beholden for a particular grant or a narrow topic. When you made that shift and you closed the lab, how did it make you feel and did you get any insights as a result of that? Well, uh, first of all, only in my department at Cornell would – would they have the vision to well, to make a deal like that where I could then write and be a public health contributor and, and the burden of doing the specific detailed grant work on lead, for example, would be gone. Um, so I think that, again, there was, a, there was a scary aspect to it. But as, as I started to do, um, to be able to write more broadly. So my wife said, why don't you contribute to the autism literature? Why don't you write about some conditions and diseases that are being ignored that where it looks like there's an immune component? I wrote a paper on the fractal nature of the immune system, which got essentially described as being, wow, this is 
really something that hasn't been explored in, 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 to, to any great extent. And while the idea of treating a, a, a what looks like a disconnected system in terms of a mathematical model to understand safety and, and risk really hadn't been done. So I was free. I was, I was, I was like, um, I'll use the analogy. And yesterday I wore them. My wife gave me a, a um, birthday present of Dobby socks from, from Harry Potter. So Dobby is free. Master has presented Dobby with clothing. So I was getting feedback like I've got, I've been presented with clothing. I, I'm free. I'm free. Dobby can think broadly. So uh, yeah, I had, I should have worn my Dobby socks today. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. So it, it, so it became, it was scary and then it was freeing. And at least the feedback I've gotten, I don't know, but I'm being told that I look at things differently, that, that, uh, and, and I, I would attribute that to this exact opportunity that I was given very and so grateful to the department and to Cornell University for doing that because very few universities would. If you could give just one piece of advice to people who are wanting to make a shift in their health, what would that be? I would actually say when they're uh, a couple things. One of them is when they're given health advice, go internally and, and see how, how it resonates with them. Just check if you have any, uh, because there are two levels. Maybe it's very good advice and maybe it would be useful, but actually if you've got a problem with it, that's worth addressing because you want your body in sync with your plan. So if you're thinking about a drug or you're thinking about changing something, you probably want your whole body aligned in sync with the plan. So I think that's really useful because we've had experiences, you know, in, in, in my family where, yeah, we were doing something because logically it seemed to make sense at the time but maybe there was we can look back and say you know there was this resistant point and i should have paid attention to the still small voice or the gut instinct or the just not not being in sync with it somehow and again it may be a good plan but deal with the not being in sync and maybe maybe you know getting in sync is the step rather than not doing it but uh, it could be you don't get in sync and maybe there's an alternative that's better than that plan. Uh, the other thing is paying attention to how your body responds to, to things. And there's both a short term and a long term. Sometimes there are things that like, well, that tastes awful. 48 hours later, well, that was useful. <laughs> you know. So we need to recognize there's a short term and long term calibration. But calibrate. Find measurements in your own body that are good, that are reliable signals for you that have been. They've probably been there. Maybe you haven't recognized them yet. And pay attention to that. So, for example, I know the earliest signal of my um, reflux or impending reflux. I know if I've gotten into a food component that's going to be a problem, I know what it feels like. I know the first sign. That's when I go to the probiotics and, and dose differently. You know, and... Uh, that's useful. I don't have to wait for any sinus symptoms or something more severe in the gut to show up that may give me less, less flexibility in putting out that fire. So I think with, with anything, know what, your, what are your go-to signs in your own body and, and then evaluate. So if you're going to do a probiotic or you're going to rebiose or you're considering a dietary change, you know, uh, to the extent that you know your own body and you can read your own body, short term and long term, that's, I think that's very useful. It's such an honor to be here and it's been an honor to interview you and learn from you. I've learned so much from reading your book and having this conversation today. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you for the opportunity to be, be on this mm. program. Amazing. Wow, we covered so much information there. I know that there will be a lot of you listening that will want to go back and listen again to this episode because there was just so much to take in. Here's a few of the key points that Rodney discussed in this episode of The Shift. Number one, your microbiome is probably the most important factor when it comes to predicting if you will develop an NCD or non-communicable disease. So while diet and lifestyle are still up there, the health of your microbiome certainly plays a very pivotal role. Number two, modern humans have a microbiome that is degraded to about 35 to 40% of that of traditional indigenous people. 
Number three, our microbes can change depending on what we eat, our environment and the other humans and pets that we co-inhabit with. Number four, your microbiome can leave you susceptible to all kinds of diseases when it is in the wrong balance, even obesity. Changing your microbiome may help you reach a more healthy weight and prevent chronic disease. There was so much science and facts in this episode, but you may be wondering, what action can I take to help my microbiome? Here's what I recommend for my patients at Shift. Number one, eat a diet that's primarily plant-based and rich in many different types of plants. Fruit, vegetables, legumes, nuts, seeds, coconut, and gluten-free whole grains are all fantastic sources of fibre. Try to keep the skin on as much as possible too. For example, the best way to eat a kiwi fruit is actually by keeping the skin on. Cut off the hard ends, wet it if you're new to this because it can be a little bit furry, and eat it with the skin on. It's some of the best fibre you can eat. Number two, avoid antibiotics wherever humanly possible. My recommendation for this is to look at the areas of your health which would cause you to need them and support your body to heal naturally. If your immune system is low or you're getting recurrent urinary tract infections or sinusitis or anything else that would cause you to need antibiotics regularly, then I'd recommend checking in with a naturopath, acupuncturist or functional medicine practitioner to support your natural immunity. Number three. Consider taking a probiotic supplement that's been proven to help restore the microbiome. Check in with your practitioner to find the best one for you. One of my favourites for microbiome restoration is Lactobacillus rhamnosus GG, sometimes referred to as LGG. But check in with a naturopath for the specifics. Lastly, I wanted to reiterate what Rodney said. When you get health advice, see if it resonates with you. Everyone is so unique, and advice that may help you may not be the best for someone else. This is where I think coming back to tuning into your body is so important, because once you come back to centre, you can really feel what is going to be best for you. Rodney is one of the most insightful and passionate humans that I've met, and if you love this conversation, please do check him out at rodneydietert.com. That's R O D N E Y. D-I-E-T-E-R-T dot com and read or listen to his book, The Human Superorganism, which is available on Amazon, Audible and all reputable bookstores. In the next episode of The Shift, we have Christine Hassler, who is an absolute powerhouse when it comes to the field of emotional wellness and getting back in tune with our bodies. Coming up on The Shift. Where do they need to look to next to make sure that they're covering that emotional aspect of it? Well, look into your past. Tell me a bit more about the self-critic. Oh, that inner critic. (laughs) It's formed early on. Isn't it interesting? Like one of the oldest sayings, you know, I've just got a gut feeling about that. Yes, yes, yes. Our gut is so smart. What's the story with emotional eating? Oh gosh, emotional eating. This is such a big one. If this episode is leaving you wanting more, I'll be hosting a live webinar on gut health. Join me and get the opportunity to get your gut health questions answered. Go to theshiftclinic.com forward slash webinar. See you there.